Chapter 5 The doctor had asked that a meeting of the engineering staff who had been assigned to provide assistance take a place at 0900 hours. It was just a few minutes before then that Geordie and his hand-picked team shuffled into the conference room. The doctor was nowhere to be found, not yet at least, and so the engineering team took seats for themselves, falling into hushed, murmured conversation. They were all specialists of varying kinds, mostly to do warp mechanics and a smattering of other fields. In truth, the Time Lord hadn't given any specifics to the sort of people he was looking for, and so the Forge opted for as varied a team and skill set as possible. The muffled conversation was cut short as the conference room's doors swished open. Right! Good morning! With a wide manic grin, the doctor breezed into the room. He had replaced his tattered outfit with a fresh one, identical to the first, obviously replicated using the ship's computer, though the suit jacket still bore soot marks, suggesting that he had chosen to wear the old one. That or and the fading bruise on his jaw were the only bits of evidence of their rather stressful day. The outfit was a complete, of course, with a bow tie, which he adjusted proudly with one hand as the dozen, half a dozen engineers openly stared. Uh, Doctor? Jordy finally asked, lifting his hand slightly. I thought Data was joining us on this project. Oh, I've been working with him for the past, he glanced at his watch, three hours already. Time flies. Didn't want to wake any of you up. We were having a marvelous time. He was just working on the TARDIS console, preparing for the interface slot I'll be using to modulate when the modulator is complete. True professional. Real pleasure to work with him. Jordy frowned a little and then nodded. All right. Well, I've got some ideas on how we could incorporate our power systems, but I need to wait to have a closer look inside your ship. Oh, the doctor interjected, shaking his head. N no. LaForge tilted his head. No? As in, as in no, nobody else is allowed in the TARDIS, the doctor explained, chuckling a bit at the thought. Certainly not with any sort of scanning equipment. That's just insane. Please don't take offense, but infusing Gallifreyan technology with more primitive cultures is, has rarely ended well, and I think everyone can agree that such matters are best approached in baby steps. You have an entire philosophy around this concept. Data's already been ordered by Captain Picard to keep his observations he makes entirely to himself, up to and including deletion of his memory banks, so the risk is minimal for him. Humans with scanners, on the other hand, no, no, terrible, terrible idea. After all, just because I'm not the doctor of this universe doesn't mean I can't believe, behave just as uh, with a little bit of responsibility when it comes to keeping the children out of a liquor cabinet. As long as we're not taking offense, right? LaForge asked, scowling a bit. Absolutely spot on, the doctor replied, cheerfully mind missing the sarcasm. Selecting a chair at the end of the conference table room for himself, he plopped down, adjusting his jacket, and then reached into one of his pockets. Out came one pad, then two, then three, then four, until he had stacked a stack of five pads rested on the table. Finally, he pulled out one more item, a bulky blue boxy thing that was at least three times larger than the pocket he tugged it from. Leaning back, he stretched, twiddled his thumbs, rotated back and forth in the chair a couple of times, and then kicked his feet up. All right, the work should be simple enough, he began. I need people to run messages, collect samples, Hope light here and there, and help me incorporate the particulars of your technology with the modulator I'm going to design, which much of it will need your hardware. Also, if anyone needs to know how to make how to, needs to make your replicators produce jammy dodges, um, Doctor? LaForge interjected, leaning forward a little. I don't mean to sound too, um, but we're not exactly first-year cadets. Captain Picard wants us to help you, and I don't think it'd be too much to ask if you just let us help you in a way other than just running errands. We have our own fields of expertise. There were nods around the table and the time were considered that point, lips pursing before he flapping his fingers. You're absolutely right, the doctor mused. My apologies, I'm accustomed to working in far earlier time periods. I obviously shouldn't be discounting your abilities. All right, Anyone who has a background in transpatial biotempering engineering, preferably with a minor in extra-dimensional singularity mechanics, raise your hand and you can join me in a tour of the TARDIS. The engineers glanced at one another and nobody moved. Certainly nobody raised a hand. Anybody? Anyone at all? The doctor waited for a long moment before announcing. Just me then? Let's move on. I've had some thoughts on how to modify the TARDIS, but I'm going to need a number of things. Three yards of optic cable, five pounds of duralium, five ounces of copper, a half pound of tin, a computational unit capable of at least 70,000 processes per second, a programmable command and control interface, a ball that to throw against the wall when I get stuck, and 
Oh, yes, I searched your database for a certain species of, color of coral that is quite critical, but unfortunately doesn't seem to have an equivalent. However, I begin to, I begin to know how to make up for this. Do you have any... He double-checked the pad before sliding it and another to the pad of engineers. Dilithium to spare? Well, yeah, LaForge re replied, shrugging. We have about 50 kilos of raw dilithium ore in, the, in Cargo Bay 3. Excellent! I just need a half a kilo. Deliver to sick bay. Selecting a third pad from the pile, he slid it across the conference table, along with a, the bulky device he had brought in. Give these to Dr. Crusher, along with the ore. Ask her if she could have one of her people follow the instructions to the, on that pad to the very letter. A single deviation from the instructions, and we'll have to start from scratch, and as this is a crucial, in, crucial ingredient, best to have it sooner than ready than later. Sign softly. The forge nonetheless gestures for the remaining engineers who took their respective pads and left the conference room with whatever dignity they could muster. The chief engineer wasn't exactly thrilled on how things turned out. Though he considered himself a pretty easygoing guy, he had actually been extremely excited for the chance to solve a bit of the riddle that was the doctor's big blue box. But it looks like that mystery was going to have to wait a little while longer. Anything else I can get you? he asked. Just reserve one of your holodecks for a day or two, the, the doctor replied. I'm going to go through a lot of trial and error work, using and discarding a few hundred different tools, some of which haven't been invented yet, and would greatly help speed things along. I already wrote a base program. Across the fourth pad. Of course she did. Accepting the pad, Geordi scrolled through it for a moment, frowning. I don't see any tool parameters. But of course not. That would file under the no-no technology sharing, the doctor replied, sounding almost offended. Just said I wasn't going to do that. I intend to write the parameters on the fly, encrypting the files, deleting them when I'm done, what have you. Anyway, I won't be needing any terribly, anything terribly exotic until the critical task in the sick bay is complete, and so the tools you have on file should be sufficient for now. Actually, I'll be using mostly my sonic screwdriver, but they're very nice tools. Very well built. Jordy nodded slowly, trying not to sound like the compliment that he was accepting wasn't quite so backhanded. Thanks. The doctor sighed a little as he considered the chief engineer for a long moment. I'd like for you to understand, this is nothing personal, any slight to your intelligence. Quite the contrary, actually. I consider your intelligence enough that I'm not comfortable letting you get a good look at the interior of the TARDIS. I've had hundreds of humans in the TARDIS, but only they wouldn't be able to wrap their heads around its mechanics, if they, even if I gave them the bloody manual. You, on the other hand, could no doubt figure out more than a few things by yourself. That's nothing to say of the spectru visual spectrum of your visor. <laughs> it's all right, Doc, LaForge replied, sighing a little, but managing to set off his disappointment. He suppose some mysteries would just have to remain that. Like you said, we do have our own rules about non-interference. And I guess from a time travel perspective, we're close to being a pre-warp civilization from your point of view. If things were reversed, I'd probably be taking the same precautions. Glad you see it that way, the doctor replied, grinning as he hopped to his feet, moving towards the exit as Geordi stared at the pad he had been given, at least until the dime time where we spoke again. Well? Cle looking up, he cle Geordi cleared his throat. Well, what? Well? The doctor replied, eyes narrowing as he couldn't believe he'd explain this. I'm off to design a modular modulator intended to tap into the very essence of the universe, and Data spoke very highly of you, so I thought you'd like to come with me to the holodecks and assist. Or just watch. Mostly I've been pottering around on my own for a while. It'd be nice to have someone to talk to, and Data will be in the TARDIS for the rest of the day. But, of course, if you're otherwise occupied. <laughs> no! Jordy cut in quickly, shaking his head and half stumbling at his feet. No, no, absolutely. I'd be happy to help in any way I can. Brilliant! The doctor grinned. Whirling on his heel, stepping out of the conference room, and called over his shoulder. Come along, LaForge! It's incredible, Jean-Luc. Picard and Dr. Crusher were in the sick bay a little over an hour later, the former staring at a set of readouts on the monitor wall with absolutely no idea what they meant, and the latter focusing her all of her attention on what the readouts were referring to. A sealed containment pod filled with a pink-tinted, transpitted, bubbling liquid. At the bottom... A chunk of dilithium crystal rested, the edges of it looking curiously edged and covered in small craters. Attached to the side of the pod was a bulky was the bulky device the doctor had delivered to her via a very irritating looking engineer. I'm following every instruction he gave me, she told him, shaking her head. Though it took a while to integrate this device into the containment pod. 
Whatever it is, something is definitely happening in the dilithium chamber in the, with the ore. Maybe it's the subspace field. Maybe it's the nutrient bath. Maybe it's the blend of radiation that the device gave, that he gave me is generating, but the actual structure of the crystal is changing somehow. I couldn't even begin to guess into what, and I dearly wish Data would t he were here to take a look. In any case, according to the doctor's instructions, it won't be ready for a few more hours, but... Captain, I wish I could pick this man's brain. I mean, not literally. Uh, well, a more detailed neurological scan would be nice, but I honestly, what he's a, I honestly wonder what he's the doctor of. I'd ask him, Picard replied, but I suspect it would just result in more questions. Still, let me know when you... Bridge to Captain Picard. The voice peeked through the com badge, cutting, his cutting off his words next. We are receiving a transmission from Starfleet Command. One moment, Bridge. Dr. Crusher, may I use your office? Of course, Captain, Crusher muttered, her eyes still locked on the readouts of her tricorder that it was offering her. Stifling a grin at her, her unrelenting fascination, Picard slipped into her office and settled into her chair, turning the monitor towards him and tapping the control. Bridge, he instructed, pipe the transmission through the Dr. Crusher's official terminal. A moment, few moments later, the face of Admiral Alexis Necheyev popped onto the screen, framed in the background by a plain gray wall of his off office in Starfleet Command's headquarters. His salt and pepper gray hair was immaculately groomed with a new haircut. His beard cropped short, and he looked very in every inch the authoritative drill sergeant. And indeed, he had been an instructor at Starfleet Academy for well over a decade before being promoted to the Admiralty. Admiral Ross. Good to see you again, Picard gre greeted with a small smile. How's San Francisco? A little too quiet for my taste, but I get by, Ross replied, his tone friendly, if a little businesslike. I just finished reading your report. Quite a story. Yes, it's been an eventful couple of last couple of days, Picard nodded dryly. But given how things turned out, they've been quite positive. Mm, yes, it's fortuitous that he was there to help, Ross's casual tone faded leaving him too intent on leaning forward, arms folded in front of him. Now, the report mentioned that his vessel is basically dead in the water until he calibrated it properly. Has, it been complete, has he completed those calibrations? No, but from what the doctor has told me, he will need at least 48 hours to complete his design, possibly more. Good. We have time, then, Ross muttered. I'm afraid I don't understand, Picard said slowly, frowning. USS Intrepid is en route to your location at, an, at emergency high warp, Jeffrey explained. It should arrive within two days. They're preparing a very special set of accommodations for this man in his blue box. And once we secured there, and once he secured, they'll transport him and his vessel back to Starfleet Command for debriefing. You are to hold position until then and give him no indications that we're coming. Picard was stunned for a long moment shifting in his chair and licking his lips as he tried to think of a diplomatic way to, to voice his displeasure. Admiral, he finally said, head tilted and slightly confused and a slightly confused smile crossing his face as if he thought the Admiral were joking. I have to confess, this strikes me as highly irregular and contradictory to the freedoms and rights outlined in the Federation Charter. For that matter, I don't really see that this behavior is necessary. From the report you've submitted, the Admiral intoned solemnly, this doctor fellow was able to circumnavigate every security protocol and encryption in the, in the Enterprise's computer mainframe. He also designed from scratch an algorithm that was able to, quote, bend the fabric of space-time in less than a minute using your commander data to input it. Commander Maddox would love to know how he did that, as well as many others in the Daystrom Institute. Jean-Luc. While Starfleet is certainly grateful to his contributions in securing this, the safety of the Alcheron colonists, we can't ignore the fact that this man possesses a level of knowledge and skill that would prove very dangerous to Starfleet, if not the entire Federation, particularly if it were to fall in the wrong hands. Admiral, I must protest, Picard countered. The Doctor has done nothing but to make himself our enemy. He admitted himself that he all but stole restricted files, Picard, and then afterwards used the information in them to save 12 thousand lives and the entire binome of Alteron Far. Picard continued, his voice raising a little. His methods are, I agree, blunt and more than a little irritating. 
as is his apparent habit of cutting through every regulation one might think to levy, but the fact remains that he, he acted like a proper guest on the ship, minded his manners, and kept quiet. Then there would have been a dead, then there would be dead men on the conscience of every officer involved in this assignment, both us included. Ross leaned forward a little, jaw tightening. I beg your pardon? It was your department, Admiral, that advanced the explanation of the of the erratic behavior of the Ultron Star, Picard snapped, and we had to adhere to those explanations. It would have, if we had ex adhered to those explanations, it would have been a disaster. Say what you will about the Doctor. I may even agree with half of it, but Maverick or no, that man performed an invaluable service to the Federation and has given us no legitimate cause to treat him so ill as to abduct him and seize his vessel as contraband. The Admiral's eyes were little chips of ice now and he opened his mouth to bellow right back, but restrained himself. The heavy-set man just drew a low, deep breath and exhaled. When he spoke again, his voice was shielded with professional detachment, his eyes focused on the desk in front of him, not meeting the captain's de eyes. Captain, I am ordering you to hold position until the intrepid arrives. I am also ordering you not to say a word of this to your visitor, and in the event that he comp completes his refit, keep him there from keep him from leaving the Enterprise at all costs. These orders come directly from Starfleet Intelligence, and though you do have a record for bending the rules, this is one you should not be testing. Trying it too would reflect wouldn't reflect well on you or your crew. Ross out. The monitor went blank for a moment and Picard couldn't help but fume as he leaned back in his seat, arms squeezing the arms of his chair. Damn!